on this one. Yeah. <laughs> well done. I was feeling the pressure, as I say, because, you know, I, I love your music. So it was a roast, <laughs> you know, that sort of horrible thing. Oh, damn, I've got to do this thing. I, I just, you know. But thanks oh, man, I love it. I, really it's... To meet you. I mean, um, I've seen you guys play together and I've seen Joey do a couple of things. So I've got questions. I guess, to be perfectly honest, I've got questions that are bro's questions. And I've got some slightly more guitaristic things, but if I'm not too much about the guitar, just tell me, can you please move on and stop annoying me? Oh, Dave, Dave is used to it. It's all good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's all you know, It's a guitar player's thing. I can, but, sleep, I can sleep with my eyes open, man. Well, it'll, it's going to come to that, I promise you. But um, <laughs> listen, great. Uh, thanks very much, Dave. You sent me that um, link to, to the new album. And this is an interesting thing. How can I say this with... You've got to take this in the most possible way. When, when, I, when I heard Let It Lie, it blew my mind. So when 87 came out, I thought, you just can't meet that. And, and there's that resistance. And I was on the road and I thought, no, I've got to give him a go. So, okay. Like, yeah, okay. And then next time it's like, oh, yeah. And now that's the one that I listen to more than Let It Lie. And I think there's stuff on this. It's really, it's got the same thing. Do you know what I mean? You've got a, it's a tough thing to to match something that's come before that's so amazing that so many people love but you seem to do it every time there's one thing just to cut straight to it that um riff i probably balls it up completely but that riff in what in the world i think is going to be one of those things uh people are really going to gravitate towards so did you play that in open sea joey like with a capital uh for you know you know what that is the one guitar part on the record that i didn't play that's murray yeah Joey. that's you know that's murray pulver our producer and every now and then oh. every now and then he'll pick up a guitar and he'll go what do you think about this for a part i'll go great let's record it and he'll go well no you play it and i go no you've already got it what's the difference if i learn it and play it or if you play it? you just play it so that's that's actually not me and that would that would have actually been in standard tuning so if you're racking your brain oh, how that was man, played no oh man there was a lot of i'm playing in open sea because because uh and there's been a lot of swearing in my house trying to figure out some of your stuff with that but oh yeah I'm doing that. And then, oh no i hate that guy it sounds like i would have sworn that was your thing it sounds like the thing sort of thing i'd expect that's amazing well and the way the way that you're playing it right now that's how i play it in open c so wow. so so that that is i mean uh it, w w what what's on the record is going to be different than what i'm going to play live just and by virtue of that but i think you did write that when we wrote the song i'm pretty sure that's the that's the part that set, that was underneath it sure and then murray, murray and then just murray, sort of put his own thing murray, on it but murray yeah actually i don't remember he played it Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, okay. Well, that, that explains it then. So it's a kind of Joey thing through this Murray sort of yeah. filters so through he, filters through filters. Yeah. And then Indeed. when he played it, he cut it on a guitar and he wove a bunch of pieces of, of full scat paper through the guitar strings. Just to make it sound kind of weird. Yeah. It was my Yamaha Revstar with, it's got a TV Tronic pickups in it. And Murray just picked it up and said, what do you think of this? And then he, it, it wasn't full scap. It was just, it was paper from uh, strings. It's like the little envelope that strings come in. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. He tore the little tongue off of that. And, yeah. But in the anyway. sound of your albums, um, it, it's a real, I, I wouldn't say it was, it's, I, I guess it's not retro, but it's that deep sort of, it sort of sounds analog because the tones are so big. Not just the guitar, the sound of you, got, you guys on the voices. But the way you put everything together, the way you layer like keyboard parts. I mean, remember, Dave, you did that recording for me like a while back that I still haven't got out. But that Paul Yi, is that how you pronounce it? Recorded that. And you guys have got such, I mean, your music's evolved, which is something I wouldn't mind talking about. But it's got that big sort of sound to it. I don't know that, I don't know that, that many people are making records with that like broader a spectrum of tone you know it's like everything you can hear all the instruments but all the instruments sound like you know like guitar tone from days of your vocal tone from when the great records were made you know what i mean without sounding old-fashioned it's a i guess it's a combination of the, the the recording 
saying and the arranging and the writing. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, in terms of the philosophy, you know, I mean, we're very much self-taught uh, in as recordists. So we just started making records because somebody said, here are the keys to our recording studio. And uh, as long as I'm not using it, go, go to town. Our, our sort of mentor, uh, Steve Bell and, and Dave Zaglinski, um, and they, uh, they just sort of gave us the run of the place. And they had some nice gear and some nice microphones. And we had a, a few pieces of gear that we brought in and sort of slowly started learning how to do this thing. That was, and that was Let It Lie. So we, we, learned, we learned a lot in that. But, you know, I think it also comes down to the music that we grew up listening to. Jesus, you all right? We almost lost Dip Brother Dave. First, first time with my new butt, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know necessarily that we're we're walking into sessions with a preconceived idea of how it's going to come come out of the speakers. But I, I, I think, you know, you have to take into consideration all of the things that happen in the periphery as you're growing up. So the music that we listen to informs the tones that we like to go for, you know, and I think um again it's not really something that's by design as much as as it's learned by osmosis so what objectively sounds good to me are sounds that are reminiscent of records that we grew up listening to mm. and then the other the other side of it is is i don't stray too far from uh vintage inspired gear you know like even even my my two rock which is one of my favorite guitar amps it it is um obviously expertly crafted but it's it's the culmination of a lot of great classic circuits all the best things that that Eli from Two Rock thought would go well together and you know a few of his own little secrets so everything is really kind of based the microphones that we use you know I sang into a, a U67 clone into a 1073 clone of course I can't afford any of the real versions of these things but you know and uh so I think at some point that's the kind of stuff that really does rub off on the sound. And, and then a big part of the sound of this record is, is our mixing engineer, Greg Kohler. And he said to us, our first meeting, because we, we're, hu we're huge fans of his work, and our first meeting, we, we sort of said, so like, break down, what's your philosophy? And he said, well, guys, I, uh, he's very soft-spoken. I, you know, my goal is really just to take all the tracks that you deliver to me and make them sound as huge as possible and we were like great you're hired <laughs> no, so so i mean you know i i certainly can't take all the credit um i can <laughs> dave, dave's gonna take all the credit everything sounds really really good because of dave uh yeah and of course paul ye did a lot of engineering on this record as well and 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 uh so we tip our hat to him as well yeah and one thing when, when you're arranging any any particular song do you have kind of a I mean, I guess you guys live close to each other, and obviously your brother, so you're, you're super tight. But do you have a particular approach to fleshing things out? If somebody comes up with a sketch and you, you're going forward, is there, is there stuff you always seem to come back to in terms of the arranging and pulling things together approach? Uh, you want to take a swipe at that? Yeah. Well, I mean, we have we have some moves that we make, and I often don't hear them until I'm listening back to older stuff. Hmm. Uh, like we just we just before we hopped in this meeting, we were we were revisiting an EP that we put out in twenty nineteen. I think no, so. Twenty twenty. Early twenty twenty, right before the pandemic hit, we put out two songs because we were going to go on tour with our friend Mariel Buckley, mm -hmm. and we wrote a couple, we wrote a song, played it, recorded it, and then um, did a cover. And when we were listening back to, and we hadn't, I haven't listened to that since we put it out. I mean, so much has happened since, since but listening to it and realizing oh yeah like there are elements of this song that have that are on this new record in terms of like there, there's some harmonic choices there's some arrangement choices yeah um and you realize that you do you do end up having some kind of you know production licks or arrangement licks that you go back to and um i i don't know i like i think at, on one hand it's important to challenge yourself to try not to fall back on those things too much to, yeah. to look for new ideas but at the same point I also I also am a big fan of uh, kind of quoting yourself or paraphrasing yourself because you know the, those are also things that make it kind of sound like us. There are chord changes that we like. Joey loves loves the 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 way melodies change over the 
over a four minor chord, for example, and we use that a lot. Yeah. Be, and that that sound of the four minor chord resolving now to me sounds like a Brothers Landra song, you know, like <laughs> and um, so, yeah. So I don't know. I think it's like there's a combination of embracing the things that, that make you sound like you while also looking for for new ways of doing things. And this record is a is a perfect example of that, like being um, bumped out of our comfort zone, making this album in a pandemic, having to do it very differently brought out all these really exciting ideas uh just just because we had to do things differently we had we had to look at it from a different perspective and had to take different things into consideration and we wound up making a record that i don't think we ever would have made otherwise right, right. so um so that, uh, yeah perfect testament to getting out of your getting out of your comfort zone sometimes to shake it up yeah i mean it's it's got that thing there's a lot there's a lot of f things that sound familiar and in in the sort of vein of things you've done, it's very different. You know, you don't do that thing. Oh, that sounds like that. That's if you don't do that. One thing that um, I listened to in the car yesterday. And I just listened to it a minute, minute ago. That tune, Corduroy. I think now that Bruno Mars has morphed into the stylistics, meaning he's doing those kind of changes. He should cover that tune because the harmony <laughs> is. Oh man, it's so killing. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind going back to this later, maybe directly with you, Joey, but. I've never heard anybody play slide guitar and do adult chords to that degree. It's like you, you've made a science of this. You've got this thing which covers all the strings and what, what can you do around it? I mean, it's, it's wild. It's really wild to, to oh, see thanks, somebody man. like really think, right, I'm going to have the same command over this thing that a, a, a serious pro would have over standard tuning with all the advantages of having played standard tuning forever. It's absolutely nuts. It's wild. So uh, I th I, there's a lot of stuff in this record that seems to come out of that. But uh, as I said, I'll come back to that. But like the acoustic stuff on this album, is that uh, is a lot of that in standard tuning? Then? No, the majority of that I think is is open D probably. Right. Uh, I think my my callings, uh, I've uh, I've tried to put it in open C and it doesn't seem to love it as much. So it's either open D or D flat even sometimes. Right. But that open tuning like one five one three five one, I, it doesn't really matter to me what the key is. And sometimes I'll tune something up because it feels better to have the you know either. When you're in open C, you play in the key of F, the frets are closer together than if you play in open D and, and you play in the key of F. And depending on where the capo is, or capo, depending on uh, where folks are listening to this podcast, uh, you know what I mean? So it's, um, in terms of how I tune, uh, it'll, it, it just sort of depends on feel. And also, I, I do kind of let the guitar tell me, it, you know, in other words, some guitars just don't sound as good in open C, and some guitars sound better in open C to wow. me. So I just I really do um, let let that choice get made, you know, sort of uh, environmentally speaking. Yeah. But in the past, I've played a lot of acoustic in standard tuning, but on this record, I don't think I did. We yeah. we we did experiment with the song that Dave sings called Shame. We did experiment with me playing that in standard tuning because uh, Dave originally wrote that song in standard tuning, but we wound up settling on something that we liked, oh. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think I don't think it stayed in standard. No, no. We, we, you know, I started trying it and I was just struggling and I was because, you know, sometimes you just want to hear standard tuning chord voicings oh. and it's just you want to hear those cowboy shapes. Yeah. But I, re I actually am remembering now that I was. I was struggling with fluency and I'm not as comfortable in standard tuning anymore. So sometimes it's just, you know, I, I, I get a little ham fisted. So that's, I think that's why it didn't live there for long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do mostly play guitar like this anyway. So <laughs> yeah, it's more lobster hands though. Is my yeah, thing. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's an amazing thing I saw. You did uh, that interview with Josh Smith and there's a, a crazy thing that you did not play in sort of a bebop line with the slide. It's like, Oh man. You got to do. You got to do. You got to do something down in that vein at some point. You you got to do it. It's like, oh dear, it's so heavy. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Really. Thank you. So, Dave, do you ever detune the whole bass or the bottom string to accommodate the key of t the various tunes? For a, for a while, for a number of years, I had my bass tuned D to 
uh, B, B to D. B to D. All right. Okay. So, so the low the low four strings of a five string bass, um, and that was partially to get out of the way of Joey, um, but also just because I I I sort of had a propensity to spend more time in the low register, and I, I jokingly would say they just sort of kept me from playing out too much. If you just run out of strings, well then. There's there's none of that weedly weedly stuff up there, <laughs> um, and uh, but you know it, it, interestingly as we've as we've grown of a, as a band and started to consider things like the sonic footprint of the whole orchestra on stage, uh, it's actually dawned on me that uh, like Joey's sound is is really kind of the cornerstone of the band, and he actually is putting out a lot more low end off of the stage than I am most of the time, right. and takes up a lot more space. So it's actually I wind up trying to sort of stay right in the middle and I, and I tend to live like in terms of the sonic print, I try and, I try and get the bass sitting a little more forward, a little bit more mid. Like I, I really, um, I really do prefer, uh, kind of vintage tones, you know, mm. like P bass and, and old seventies yeah. bass sounds, but, yeah. um, yeah, so, sort of leaving room for Joey on the bottom and then me get, trying to, trying to sit somewhere just, just above there or just out of the way. Seems right. to work in terms of uh, just making sure that there's a lot of space in that. Yeah, that 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 answered the question really. It's like I was wondering, do you do you try and get under Joe the range of what Joey's doing because he's he's got that low C going. It's there's not a lot of places to go really. It's just without whales being the only creatures they could. Have. <laughs> yeah, we don't, that, don't. That answers that answers that question. Yeah. I do tend, to, especially nowadays, I do tend to cut a fair amount of bottom end, uh, right. and I I feel like it gives me a little more. Well, I don't feel. I know it gives me a little more headroom. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, I'll I'll just walk up to my amp, and sort of thump on it, and wherever it sounds good, I turn it down a little bit from there, and yeah. it's like, oh, it doesn't sound as good. And then Dave starts to play, and it's like, ah, it sounds just as good. So, yeah. it, you know, there's. There's a lot to consider, and I think our 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 sort of experience making our own records um, has helped us m make decisions about shaping our tone. And and you know that like, yeah, while you know the the bass is sort of a low instrument, it's not the lowest frequency on the stage certainly. So it's it's okay if you're not pushing thirty hertz out of your bass amp. You know, it's okay for you to 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 focus more on like uh, between a hundred and two hundred. Right. And you know, so we're 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 learning these lessons as we get old, as we get older. Well, I mean, this record's so good, man. I mean, as I say, that corduroy team was killing. I mean, the whole thing is just just amazing. So thank you so much. I, when, when I remember when I I heard "Let It Lie" first, I thought, man, who are these guys? Because the groove is like, oh man, it's just so amazing. The way just the the way everything's placed is just apart from all the other runners playing the singing. The tunes, just like, did you? How did you get to that point where it was, you know, so evolved that the the placement, the way you're all judging where to put every note, just in this very focused way, but it still sounds relaxed, but sort of, I don't know, very focused. It was there a period of experimentation with with the way that you play grooves. Um, I think, well, yeah, I mean, like, the, the, like the first, the first record, uh, was Dave and Ryan Voth. Yeah. And you guys did so much playing, whether you were consciously yeah. messing around with note placement, but you guys found that place through thousands of gigs together. It, right? yeah, it wasn't conscious though. Like it, right. it was, it was a byproduct of, of playing together and getting to know each other's playing to a point where we were no longer you we didn't have to talk about it or think about it ryan knew that i ryan knew that i played a, a certain way and that i have a tendency to sit way back uh and he compensated for it or ignored me effectively <laughs> and that worked but like you know it worked we we developed a thing that really worked and uh, i think more so is that we found when we made this record without ryan that then we be, just became really aware of how how that dynamic shifts with a new drummer with a new a new person in that seat yeah um and it and then it just took a little time for me to settle 
to the idea of making a bros a brothers landers record because i play with a lot of drummers mm -hmm. over my career i've played with tons and tons of drummers uh that all play very differently uh, but when it comes to making brothers landreth records we've always done them a certain way and the first joey record too like whiskey that was me and ryan as well and for wow. ariel's first record yeah was me and ryan i had this long list of a discography that ryan and i recorded on yeah. so this is the first time that we did something without him and, and it suddenly just brought that to light like oh okay i, got, I gotta i can't lean into him I, I have to bring my own thing on my own two feet kind of and it's so so i think i am i think i am realistically playing a bit differently uh because i'm I'm having to be a little more in charge of of the time and be a little more accountable for it because ryan was always whether in the studio or or on stage was kind of always the the he's very metronomic yeah he's the north star we all we all sort of fell into what he was doing he, he would give us the tempo and we would all sort of be like hey there it is we're just going to lean into it yeah. um but this version of the band is a lot more is a lot more open and has a lot more dynamic. And it's not to say better or worse, it's just different. Yeah. Like we love, 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 love playing with Ryan. Yeah. Um, but we easy. also really love what we're doing now and, it, and it's a very different thing. And yeah. everybody's a little more accountable for that. Right, yeah. For the feel and the time. I mean, there's been a there's been a progression in there. Like the first incarnation was Ariel playing the, the other guitar. Uh, years ago. No, well, that was actually, me. that was actually, I will just correct you, that was actually V2 of the band. Oh, was it? Right. Yeah, okay. the first, the first three years of the band, uh, the first two years of the band was just me, Joey, and Ryan. It was a trio. Oh, okay. Version. Then, then we hired a keyboard player and we toured with him for two years. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and then Ariel came in. So we've actually had quite a few, quite a few different incarnations of this outfit. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, the progressions, I didn't even know there was a prior stage of it all uh yeah. so a few years ago joey i saw you do a, a clinic at peach guitars in the uk which is just you on your own and that that made me that was that blew my mind because i'd seen you play with another guitar player so it, i was absolutely stunned to see somebody fill the room with their voice on the guitar like that i don't think i've heard a lot of people play solo guitar stuff and you know a lot of people play some very ornate stuff but i've never heard anybody fill a room in quite as um consistent a way and I'm, it's not not contrived one thing i clocked there was you were playing tunes from some of the tunes from let it lie and some other stuff that was i think whiskey uh was out then um that was wild to hear you just take control of the guitar was so was that something that you got together later on or, or had you been able to do that stuff for years and years and years like to really be confident enough to sit down, sing your tunes, just over your own accompaniment, and have it just like fill the fill the place. No, that that was something I worked really hard on, and when I first started playing solo shows, when when Dave and I decided that we needed to to rest the band for a little, hmm. um, I I kind of underwent a bit of a of an identity crisis because I I was I was really struck by this feeling that people weren't going to want to hear me just sit there and, and play songs that they were going to want to hear me play guitar and shred. And so <clears throat> I went through a bunch of different ideas for how I could do that on my own without, and I, I just couldn't afford to travel with the band mm -hmm. uh, in the early days of my solo stuff. So, you know, to the point of like having loopers looping, looping a drone and then harmonizing it with a harmonizer pedal. And, you know, I had like presets saved into a, uh, an even tied uh, pitch factor to make different triads. And I was I went through this whole thing and, and my manager, Stu, came to the first show and he was like, man, I just can't get over the fact that all I can hear on stage is you stepping on buttons while you're playing. Like is is there is there a way that you just is there a world where you just play this show? Yeah. Like and don't worry about all that shit. And I was like, ah, damn it. <laughs> um. And so then my, when when I, when he said that, it really kind of hit me. Like I am hiding behind what I think people want from me, but I think what would do the music the most service is if I could just play the hell out of this stuff on the guitar. And reimagine it. I'm not going to try and make this uh, an electric guitar moment. 
I, I, I mostly play the show solo on electric guitar. Like, I mean, at that point in time, it was back in 2016, 17, I was playing half acoustic, half electric. And um, I, uh, I just put a lot of work into trying to play as clearly as I could. And I, I would record myself practicing and listen back and go, okay, what's, what's working? What's not working? Is this too much? Is there not enough here? And what I discovered was, you know, it's just kind of like some of these song, songs, songs like um, uh, Gone Girl and Time Served. And they just wanted a really solid accompaniment with clear, clear harmony underneath it. Nothing fancy, too ornate, just really clear harmony so that you could, the melody and the chord changes could speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it really became about getting myself out of the way. But I had to put a lot of work into my craft because, you know, I spent a lot of my career doing this and soloing, but not a lot of my career doing this. Yeah. So I had to sit for like, I, I probably put two months worth of work into, into Gone Girl alone just mm -hmm. trying to get the strumming pattern to feel good and, and to try to get myself to not speed up so much. And, um, and I think it really paid off and it really helped me move into the next phase of whatever our creative thing was, because I think in that I, I discovered that while I love to play the guitar, the, the, the song really is the thing that's most important. And I, and I felt it right away, like immediately as soon as I went out and played shows with that in mind, people were responding so much more to the material. Mm -hmm. And the moments that I did choose to like go out and just play my ass off, um, they were more gratifying. And, and, it, and it didn't feel weird to just stop the harmony and play a solo, as long as you could still hear the chord changes in, in what I'm playing. Yeah. And that's what I, where I found, okay, I don't need some gadget spitting chord changes out to me. I just need to play the changes more clearly. Yeah, right. So yeah. anyway. I could I could talk about that for a long time. I really like talking it's, about that. It's, it's really heavy. I mean, that's one of the best gigs I've ever seen. Just you doing that. It's like, oh man. Thank you. And you're Thank very you. self-effacing about this stuff because I mean, if any any guitar players haven't seen any of this stuff, you need to get on YouTube and check it out because the Joey's been more than modest because it's it's some of the best guitar playing I've ever heard. I mean, I tell you one thing that blew my mind on that. You were you were reharmonizing some stuff. It's like <laughs> This guy's got such a big brain, it's terrifying. Really, like you <laughs> I don't fancy playing those chords. It's like he's reharmonizing all these tunes. That, by that time, I probably heard every one of the tunes on that Let It Lie album about 500 times. But oh man, killing, really killing. Well, you know? Thank you. I mean, you. very inspiring. So, yeah, it was nice to hear you say that because it has to be that deliberate. One thing that blew my mind in, in that um, interview you did with Josh Smith a little while back. You mentioned a name that uh, a lot of teachers are getting quite obsessive about, Barry Harris. Mm. And that's wild to hear somebody who's not an, an out-and-out full-time jazz player talk about Barry Harris. But by the same token, it, it, it kind of isn't surprising, you know, to have to, that you're interested in that because you're obviously really deliberate about the science of harmony. So have you had any chance to pull that into your stuff your own stuff yet yeah i mean if you listen if you listen to um off the new record do you have the whole record I, or I've, got it, I've got it as a download so i haven't got it in my phone or anything but yeah play it. A, the song you don't know me it really is and it's very it's very uh simple barry harris uh, diminished sixth ideas but like the whole the whole song is kind of built off of this Right. that concept of of um the the barry harris major diminished sixth scale yeah right. um so and, and it's not super overt but there are moments where it happens yeah. and then the bridge section kind of leans into uh diminished harmony but in a in a different in a sort of different way and channelings uh, sort of a different a different person a little bit but it is it is very much lives in that diminished world yeah I mean, if, if you, I mean, this is to both of you. I mean, if you had to describe where your sort of harmonic sense comes from, what are the, what are the records or artists that you, you can recall really having to figure out what people are doing to, to get to the next level of understanding how chords relate to each other? Because it's a, it's a big bag of tricks you got. I, I couldn't, I, I wouldn't know quite what to, what to suggest. 
mine was like my mine is James Jamerson. I think like when I'm when I'm hearing stuff in my head or if I'm listening to a song for the first time and I'm imagining how I'm going to get from one chord to the next, the like the um the inner voice in my head that I'm hearing is singing James Jamerson. Yeah. Is singing singing bass lines that sound like they'd be Motown lines. That's not what I end up playing most of the time because that's not appropriate over most of the music that I play, but for me that's like that's kind of where my heart is and even though I never studied jazz, I didn't put the time in that Joey did or a lot of my friends around town did, but I, but Jamerson did. He came up on bebop and was yeah. a real heavy bebop aficionado. He, that was I can't remember who his teacher was, but he studied with a bunch of really heavy bebop cats coming up and that's why his bass lines sound the way they do yeah. uh, and the way they bend harmony and use you know outside notes and yeah, you know, land on some some notes you wouldn't expect but mm -hmm. i can hear that in you playing definitely it's, it's like um pino paladino's got that in there too that sort of way of it's very very controlled way of leading from one chord to another with some really interesting choices i can definitely hear that it always surprised me that that i don't always see you with a precision to be honest i always think are you, are you, like I must play precision. I, I don't think I've ever seen you play precision. I I've got two bases. Basically, I've got a, a stable of precisions. I've got a, a an old Fender. I've got a, a two Mulan uh, precision bases. One with a maple neck and one with an ebony neck. And then uh, I've, I've even got an old Squire fretless precision. So I do mostly play precision basses, but I also have a Duesenberg Star Player, which yeah. is like a short scale. Yeah. Is it a hollow body? Yeah. Quasi hollow body. Yeah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so that that lately I've been playing a little bit more, but with this trio now I've gone back to the the P's in the in the quartet version of the band. Uh, having the slightly fluffier bass in the background worked really nicely with the piano. Yeah. yeah. But now that we're in the trio, I find having it like we were talking about earlier, having a sound that's a little more forward and a little uh, more well, focused, little yeah, a little more focused, a little more mid is nice. And, and the precisions do that; they have a little bit more bark than the than the hollow body. So yeah, see that that business of you know you you're saying you didn't study jazz, but you studied Jameson. So it's like that naming thing. It's I don't know how important that is. Like where's Montgomery? He didn't go to music college. He figured out how things work for I think he I think his gig was playing Charlie Christian's stuff verbatim yeah. and then with a big band and I think like the piano player would say you know you could try this here try these notes over this chord and then he gradually expanded it by trying stuff I mean obviously the guy was amazing but I don't know if he would have known the altered scale from a hole in the ground but it's you know really studied the sound do you know what I mean it doesn't really matter yeah. what, how you perceive the things as long as you you are sensitive to the fine differences between one thing and another or how I think later. yeah I think that's a real uh it's a real problem that's kind of endemic to guitar players but to music uh, in general is that we we forget that the music exists outside of the theory like the theory is only the thing I like I like to say like the theory is this is the language to describe the phenomenon of music, but music exists without it. And like when you look at Barry Harris as a great, for example, and you, you hear some of the harmony that he pulls out of one eight note scale. Mm. And then you realize that this is act, like so much of bebop comes from that and not European centric scale theory you know, where, okay, we have the melodic minor scale and it, you know, you get the ma minor major seven, you can apply it and yada, yada, yada ways to, you know, get the altered, an altered chord, altered scale, blah, blah, blah. That's not what these, these guys were thinking in the early days. They were, they were, they were just chasing sounds around. And some of, some of these chords that we have been justifying using European music theory were not used that way. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was so much more emotional decisions were made from an emotional perspective and not like a, I wonder what scale goes over this chord kind of way. And I think that like, that's what I love about the Barry Harris system. What I love so much about it is that it gives you access to so many sounds without having to go through the filter of trying to justify it. Oh. And I think that 
maybe in in one way we kind of view that as laziness, but but it I think it's not. I think it's actually getting back to the to the origin of what music is supposed to be, which is storytelling and community uh, building. Mm -hmm. And like when you listen to James Jamerson, you could go, oh yeah, I I hear you pulling this stuff from Ron Carter or whatever over heard it through the grapevine or you could say man it sounds badass when you play that <laughs> you know what i mean yeah and and i think either either or is is good so i don't know i think like we we're always we're always looking for the thing to make an excuse as to why we're not more fluent with it and we always go back to oh i don't know enough theory yeah. and then and then somebody like wes montgomery flies in the face of that and we kind of we kind of say well that's he's an anomaly Mm. And it's and it's like no, I don't think so. Oh, actually, yeah, I I, I think that he's the one plugged into the reality of what music is, yeah, and right. we're the ones that are on the outside. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I mean, um, I get, there's I'm, another tangent I could yammer my way. No, not at all. I mean, like outer, outer space on, but years ago I did a transcription book of where's his stuff, and one thing he does, it's like it can only come from inspiration. So two, five, one, and F. You'd be playing G minor seven, C seven. And on the C7, approaching the F, he'd play an E major triad, which is the wrongest of wrong. You know, the, the uh, sorry, I, uh, yeah, an, an E major triad. So it's got a note B in it. An E major triad over the C7, which is like wrong city. But when it lands, when it craft, the way he crafts it, it's like, okay, you just heard that as a shape and it sounds killing. And there's a, yeah, but, but I mean, like, it is what it is. It doesn't matter yeah. where it comes from. Yeah, but E major is the tonic diminished to F, so it's it's totally yeah, right. it's a five it's a five one to F. Yeah, right. But uh, I mean, but also it just sounds awesome. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which, which supports yeah. what you're saying is it's not really about that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah, and I think like harmony to me is all about creating tension and releasing it. If you're going five to one, or you're going g13 flat nine to c major seven sharp 11 yeah it's all about creating tension and releasing it and what what is more tense sounding than moving a triad down by half a step that's about as far away as you could get from where you where you're trying to go yeah and i, I watched this great video with rich brown who's a toronto-based bass player unbelievable and he was talking about his approach is to playing over a two five one, and you know he's going. Well, the two chord you can use uh, Dorian, uh, the one chord you can use Lydian or Ionian, and he sort of gave a couple of different examples. And then when he got to the five chord, he was like, "When I get to the five chord, I just kind of play anything." And then he just went through and was like, "So the like if the if G is the five chord, okay, here's here's me playing E major over the five chord, and it's kind of like this thirteen flat nine sound." Yeah. Here's me playing C sharp over the five chord. Here's me playing G minor over the five chord. Here's me playing G flat over the five chord. Like he he did everything. He tried everything, and he was like, as long as you play it confidently and you land back on the one chord, it's all gravy. Yeah. And I, that was really powerful to me because I because I think I'm always trying to find a way to justify something theoretically. Like I'm always trying to find oh it fits because you could draw lines from this place to that place and that works. But what Rich was saying in that interview really, really blew that out of the water because it really does become about creating tension and releasing it. And that's, that's there's really a really hip need. thing that I read um, in a textbook. Well, the Barry Harris thing. So say you say you're running, you know, the, the, the C6, let's say you're doing C6 alternating with B diminished. This is a really cool thing that saw this piano player teach it. If you borrow a note from the next one you're going to, so say at any point, Say you're playing on the C chord, borrow one of the notes of the diminished and suspend it and then resolve it by moving to the, to, to the diminished. So you're borrowing notes from the other, no, other chord of the pair. So you get like yeah. suspensions all the time. That sounds really cool. And then you can do two voicings at the same time, which again, I'm starting to sound really academic, but it's one of those things, like one of those moves could sound really powerful, you know. Yeah. I'm gonna send you the textbook I got it from. Oh, I'm, I'm, fr I'm familiar with the idea. Uh, oh. And it's 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 also like if you do that uh, diatonically speaking, you're playing in the key of C major, and you play you play borrow notes from D minor. You're not really all of a sudden playing D minor seven just because you got a D minor and a C happening at the same time. It's still going to sound like the one chord, but just like I kind of 
imagine it as lopsided. Mm-hmm. And it, it creates that sort of suspension and, and release. And I think that's why the Barry Harris thing is so profound is because it 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 generates more complex harmony, but it still follows very simple harmonic rule, which is tension and tension and release. Yeah. The bit, the diminished sixth gives you some specific things that you can work with, and some specific places to start for, with your ideas, but it is still very, um, very instinct led. You mm. know what I mean? Mm. Whereas I feel like when somebody's like okay, I have this chord. What do I, what do I solo over it with? It's like that. I think that's the wrong question. Right. And I think the right, maybe some of the more right questions are like, what is this chord trying to do when we go from a point A to point B? What's, what's the process? Why does this work? And if you find something in there that goes, oh, hey, look, there are leading tones here and there. Those are the things you need to lean in on, not trying to find you know, a scale that just miraculously works over top of it. That's why pentatonics work so well is because pentatonics have so many strong chord tones and then and then no dissonant notes. Like if you think about a, pe- a major pentatonic removes the tritone, the four and the seven. So there's no there's no possible way for us to stumble on a shitty sound. <laughs> so and and that's beautiful. But it's it's also it allows us to kind of, you know, chase our instinct around a little more, which I think is People are always saying, oh, I want to get away from my pentatonic ideas. And I think, uh, I don't think you should get away from the pentatonic idea, but I think you should just play it more intentionally instead of just, you know, running it up and down. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. So years ago, I played with this Irish sax player. It was a real heavyweight. We were playing Clang. We were playing with Van Morrison, which was an experience. And this guy is a great player. A really great player, and I'd I'd been in that bracket where I was thinking stop playing that pentatonic shit, and I've been like that for for years. And this guy on the sax was kind of trying to play. Or, bear in mind, this guy's a monster bebop player, but he was playing a lot of pentatonic lines, and kind of a lot of inside pentatonic lines in the midst of all the other stuff. And it made me rethink just how beautiful that sound is. It's like the way this guy played it. It was. Oh man, it just changed my playing back to that. It's like, what's wrong with it? It sounds great, and it suits the sound of the guitar as well. So I have to sort of rediscover that. Yeah, I think I because I, I I don't do much these days, but I've done a lot of teaching uh, in the last handful of years, and and something that I always end up with is people going, "I'm I'm I'm sick of playing the same old thing, and I'm looking for something new. Give me some new chord shapes, or give me some new scales." It's like, that's not going to fix the problem. The problem is you are not showing up to your moment. Mm. You know, you have more than enough in your bag to make beautiful music. You're just trying to do it on autopilot. And you're hoping that somehow some something is going to fix that for you. But the thing is, you know, and I I would go like, okay, what's the first lick that you play when you pick up your guitar? What's the first that's in your hands? And they'd go, oh, it's this. And I would go, okay, cool. Is there a spot in that lick where you could go somewhere else? Mm. They go, oh, I never thought about that. It's like, well, try it. And then they like struggle. And you go, okay, just literally stop playing the lick halfway through and decide to go somewhere else. That's what I'm talking about. And it's it is it is actually just that simple. But you have to be in the driver's seat instead of in the passenger seat. And that's what's hard for people is because when when you put yourself that far in the moment when you're playing, it makes you very vulnerable. And yeah. nobody wants to be vulnerable. <laughs> like, it's scary. So, but when you are, when you are vulnerable and you're willing to go to that place and you're willing to take a risk, you're willing to make a mistake, you're not afraid to fall on your ass and sound bad, that's that's where really cool stuff happens. Yeah. And uh, I, had a, I had a tremendous experience um, years ago. Lenny Kravitz, he, I don't know if it, he still does, but his keyboard player at the time is originally from Winnipeg. And so when Lenny would play the arena here in town, his keyboard player would come in a little early to visit family. And this had happened like probably four or five different times. And they, the whole band would show up and they would come and play at one of the bars that we used to play in. <clears throat> and one on one of the tours, they came through town and the usual band that would host this jam with, with the Kravitz band wasn't around. So I got the call to put the band together. So... I got to play with Craig Ross and Franklin Vanderbilt and the horn section, and it was it was massive. And 
we're playing Bill Withers Use Me, and I'm standing next to Craig Ross. Craig Ross is playing. I had this lime or uh, surf green Mexican strat, which is a total piece of shit. Um, but he was playing that, and it was, you know, we, everybody was taking a turn, taking a solo, and the and one of the horn players looked at me and said, "Go." And so I start to play, and it's going really, really well. And I'm try I'm I'm playing all these great ideas, and it's landing, and I'm like, "Yes, I'm doing it." I'm kicking ass in front of Craig Ross. And then somewhere, like engine three of four goes, and then the, the plane starts to, and then the other engine goes, and then the whole thing crashes and burns and explodes into a fiery massacre. And I just, I completely shit the bed. And I was horrified because I I just, I, I just played all of these horrible notes in front of these world-class musicians and I, I kind of lift my head at the end and Craig Ross elbows me and goes, that was fucking awesome. <laughs> and I thought, like, what what could you possibly think was awesome about that? And I, and what I took away from it was, I think in that moment, maybe he thought that I didn't care that I was standing next to him and I just went for it. Yeah. And whether or not that's what, or maybe he was making fun of me, I have no idea. But that's what I took away from it was this in these moments you just have to go for it and some it, it, like sometimes you gamble and sometimes you lose yeah. and what's so bad about making a mistake I, I in fact like over over the course of our career i i'm pretty well known by our our fans for not remembering lyrics and i used to be it, it gave me such anxiety to get on stage and know that i was going to forget lyrics and i'm going to forget lyrics to a song that is meaningful for people and I don't want to I don't want to ruin this moment what what I discovered was like when I mess up a lyric uh and I fess up to it in the moment it just it brings a moment of levity and it allows the audience and the band to connect on a human level hmm. and it's a really beautiful thing and so this these imperfections are actually things that we should celebrate and lean into because it I think like when I watch my heroes get on stage and and shit the bed, it makes me feel like, oh, we are the same. Yeah, you know, we we're just people out there trying to trying to do our best to express ourselves, and some nights are better than others, and that's just what it is. And I hate this idea that we always have to operate at the absolute upper upper end of our capability because that's not reasonable, you know. And Anyways, I'm I'm off on a on a full on tangent. No, not but... at all. I mean, in in doing the, doing it the way you do it, you're opening yourself to the inspiration, aren't you? There's a chance that at any moment you're going to just come up with something just completely amazing. Whereas a lot of people are very very they like control freaks, where they want to know that everything's going to work and that everything's laid out. Yeah, and, you know, there's no risk. It's like it's like almost like a psychopathic way of playing music. It's like I want to be in control. Well, you can't always be in control. And you there's know. No, but the yeah. way you do it, you're you're really you're going for it, and that's where the you come up with the amazing stuff. Sorry, Dave. Well, I was just I was just going to add that you know the reality is is live music is a bit of a blood sport when <laughs> when you're when you're talking about going to see bands that I like that we're we're a band that musicians like to listen to, and that's always been something I've been incredibly proud of. We didn't set out to do that. It just happens that a lot of our fans are musicians. They're either you know, sometimes serious musicians, sometimes hobby musicians, but most of the people that come, not most, but a good chunk of the people that come to our show will go home and pick up a guitar or a bass or a piano. And when you go to see a concert like that, when I go to see a concert like that, it's not exciting if I know everybody's going to stick the landing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there is part of you that's like, I want to see this crash and burn. I want to see you try. I want to see you go for it. I want the excitement of re reaching for something that you don't know that they're going to land because that's that's where all the fun comes. And I don't remember the best shows that we've ever played, but I remember all the shitty ones. And I remember them fondly. I, I think back to shows where like, just like, oh my God, that was brutal. <laughs> but you survived it and you learned something from it and you go on and you had like... Yeah, because making music is, is about connecting and it's about... It's about being a part of you, either your like your community being your band, your community being the community that you live in, your audience, your audience and their community. And so when you have those honest human moments, it allows everybody in, Yeah. you know, and 
I think of all the people that I know that never take any risk. And yeah. they're always like, it's, it, that's ego driven. That's like, I want you to see me play and I want you to think, my God, that person is amazing. Yeah. I don't care about that. I did when I was younger, in my older day. I don't give a shit if you like my music or not. I don't care if you like my guitar playing. I, I'm over it. I, to me, like, the thing that I, I, I just, I like making music with my friends. I like hanging out with my brother. And when I mix those two things together, I have a great time. Yeah. And on those nights, like, you know those nights when you've had a great gig and you're like, holy, everything, the set list, was per everything was perfect. You go down the list of things. You go, okay, my, my volume was here. My treble was here. I had this pedal on. I didn't have this pedal on. I used this cable. Uh, this time I put my cable backwards instead of that. Okay, I'm going to do that all the same way tomorrow night. We never go through and say, where was my head? Yeah. And what, what, for me, when I have that amazing night and I think about it, I realize, okay, well, like I've had amazing nights where my guitar sound was not good or my monitor sounded awful or I was singing badly, but I still had a great time. And what is that thing? And the thing is, uh, where where was my head during the show? Am I present? Am I like in my own body, experiencing the music together? Am I listening to my brother? You know, waiting for the moment when Dave Dave is my favorite bass player because he is not afraid to completely <laughs> crash and burn. Yeah, man. And Go and there it. there are lots of moments when he plays the clang in a stinky note, and I'll always turn around and give him a look. But it's because we know that we know that it, as long as he's taking those risks, he's he's also going to have these moments of sheer brilliance. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones you have to listen to because if you're there and you can respond to it, then you start to you're making things. And it, I don't know, it's all about making stuff. Yeah, it's all about making stuff. Risk, risk and reward too. Like you pick yeah. you pick your moments, and and you try and find musical and complementary and you know. Uh, uh, the right emotional place to step out and, and try and say something. Yeah. And when you, when it does land then it's a moment of celebration and we are, we're all in it together. And when it doesn't work, you know, we give each other a little smile or a, a little chuckle on stage and off you go, you try, try again next time. But yeah, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't make room for those, those kind of, that kind of stretch or you give yourself that kind of latitude to make mistakes, then, then you'll never get those truly satisfying moments. Yeah. And I don't know. And I guess it's different. Everybody has something that they want to get out of the experience. Every artist is different. Every musician is different. But that's certainly, I think, something that we are, that we are, that we we see eye to eye on. It's not about perfection. It's about connection. Well, I think that mindset it, it, it makes so much sense. I, this is great, by the way. There's so many quotable things. I'm <laughs> I'm going to go publish a little book of Joey and Davisms. But um, <laughs> just that that. Killer Instinct is the best thing I can come with, although that's got a very negative sort of um, influence. It's like that dedication for looking for that moment. And, and what I'm thinking, I'm, look, I, I'm looking at another screen here with a half assed transcription I've done of um, the guitar part on a video you did a few months ago. It's got to be you, just you and a, you two guys on a drum machine. And <laughs> man, it's just... You, you, you guys don't just don't quit until you come up with something great. Can I murder this for you? Can I tell you why? It, why? Can I destroy it? And then can I tell you what I what really knocked me out? I don't know if I can even play. But the, what I'm getting at is there's a there's a degree of there's a degree of control of the voices that is. Oh man. And then. that that so you've got that you've got that science of what the hell is around the slide and every every bit of it is different and it's grooving like hell but there's all this stuff that other guitar players can geek out on that just there's so much bloody music Does that? Uh, every one of those lines 
with that stuff around the slide. It's just, oh man, I want to steal all of it all the time. I, I can't play that double stop stuff, but my guitar action needs to be about a centimeter high. Is that the way you do that? Kind of? I can't really see your fretboard, but I think I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, the point is not really the detail. Though. You're playing like you've got a sick yeah. in there all the time. So yeah. that, what I'm getting at really is you've got that science of finding the like the chromatic moves between the chords to a degree that I've, I've never heard anybody. I've definitely never heard anybody saying anything like you can or write tunes like you boys can do with this degree of detail. It's like a bottomless well of stuff. And it's got to come out of that mindset that you were just describing, which is which is to to go for it and get and and aim at these moments of inspiration. But to me, whilst you're in the moment, you've got this bag of tricks that just it just keeps giving. It's yeah. man, that just blew my mind. I've got to say, if anybody's watching this hasn't seen that, I, I think it's called it's got to be you with Roland. It must be your <laughs> friend with <Edward, laughs> machine. But, uh, yeah, yeah. And every time you come around like you do that, instead of you do this, and then the next time you can, oh, just so out there. Somebody's got to do a book of transcriptions of the band and your guitar player, man. It's, oh, thank you. It's, it's, I would buy that in about half a second. If I saw it on Amazon, somebody's done a transcription of, of the bros and Joey's guitar parts. Yeah, my credit. I, I I've been wanting to to do something like that. I mean, the reality is is I don't have the I don't have the time to do these transcriptions. But I I got a buddy who's really good at doing them, and he's done he's he's done a couple of transcriptions of stuff of mine, and, and it's really really good. So I emailed him like a year ago, saying, "Hey, would you want to do this?" He said, "Yeah," and I never got back to him. So I should I should get. Oh, back you on should it. do it because people. I mean, it's just you know, people will just go nuts for it. Listen, guys, I, I don't want to take more of your time. I know you're doing a lot of promo. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say congrats with uh, Bonnie Raitt covering Made Up Mind. That's fantastic. Thank Thanks, you so much. Man, yeah, Many big time covers, I'm sure. It's just, that's that's where you guys should be. It's, you know, oh, thanks. Songs are so beautiful. If there's one person who watches this who hasn't checked out Bro's music, oh, man, you're missing out. You need to get stuck in there. And Come on over to the dark side. Lock, coming in, the water's beautiful. Listen. Thanks for your time, guys, and uh, I'm, I'm going to try and catch you the next time you're over. In fact, I've got a gig for you. If you want an extra date, I've got a college teaching gig and with, with a live space if you want to, like, fill in dates sometime. Okay, good but Good I, to know. Definitely good to know. Day to help pay the bills or something. Certainly. Well, I appreciate it's that, Andy. Ever so much, guys. A killer new record. Good luck. Hey, and th thanks for the intro song. That's, yeah, uh, we love it. It's, br it's brilliant. Oh, thank you guys all the best i'll see you later okay. and, and you too bye bye andy bye thanks bye. for your time man thanks a lot. Bye. talk soon